Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Monday, July 24th. We've got a big day on tap today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Then we will get to your calls and questions. And then coming up in just about 30 minutes, we're going to get started on that big day um, with a very special guest, a retired Navy SEAL. I think you're always a Navy SEAL, though. Um, Don Mann is going to be joining us here in about 30 minutes. We'll be talking with Don. Don is also one of the keynote speakers at the NASTIC conference this year. Uh, I'll also be doing a keynote. Um, Two keynotes at this event. I'll be kicking off the event on the first day, uh, and then I have some other events I'll be doing throughout that weekend, and then Don Mann will be wrapping up the event with his keynote speech. If you don't know who Don Mann is, you might want to go check him out. A pretty incredible list of accomplishments. Um, I don't want to get too deep into it. I'll wait till he gets here to join us. I got up this morning and looked at my schedule. It's not that I didn't know. I knew what it was, but when I looked at it this morning, I thought, well, it's quite a day. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Don Mann, the Navy SEAL, here this morning. And then later on today, I'm going to be interviewed uh, by Dr. Wolfson, the cardiologist. So, um, oh boy, looks like we're having some issues. Uh, Check it out. We might be having some audio issues. We're checking things out in the background now. Uh, So, a lot going on today. Um, We can take some calls. We can actually have calls on the line for Don as well. As a matter of fact, even if you don't want to call it and ask the question, um, one of the things I'd love to hear from you in the next 20 minutes or so is what question would you ask a very accomplished Navy SEAL? Uh, Just being a SEAL is a pretty big deal. When you look at what Don has accomplished, it's absolutely mind-boggling. What would you ask him? Uh, you can just call and leave your question with Morgan is screening this morning. You could send me a message on uh, the tribes. I'll monitor that wherever. If you've got an idea for a question, go ahead and send it over. Um, oh, yeah. Lisa just reminded me the Dr. Wilson interview later today. That's just on my schedule. You won't be able to listen to that while we're doing it. That's a recorded video podcast we'll be doing later today and then uh it will be released and when it's released later on we'll certainly remind you and let you know a couple things i want to talk about some calls are coming in we're going to get to those um yellow the big news we've been talking about yellow i fully expected they would have been on strike today and they're not you know i said last week this is like the song that never ends this just makes me crazy So yet the Teamsters agreed not to go on strike against Yellow, and I don't understand why not. Yellow is done. Somebody just needs to stick a fork in it. This is going to do nothing. So what we were hearing was by, as of the end of last week, 90% of Yellow's freight had disappeared. They're being removed from electronic systems. They're being removed from TMSs. They have no freight and there's no way they can survive. And here's all that happened. That The pension fund, the union pension fund decided to go ahead and continue the benefits for the yellow drivers. That's all that happened. And because of that, the union decided not to go on strike. But I I don't see any path for this company to come back and, and survive. So I don't know why we keep delaying the inevitable. Um, I, I saw a lot of headlines where it says disaster averted. Wasn't averted. It was delayed at best. This is, it's not going to take long, I don't think. But this kind of stuff, I I don't even understand why the Teamsters would do this, especially given the fact that this week they've got to start negotiating with UPS, which is a much, much bigger deal. Let yellow just go away like it should. But of course, we've got one more thing just to prolong the pain. Uh, What else? Um, Not that this is any big deal, but I thought it was odd. I logged into Twitter this morning to check on a couple things and it's not Twitter anymore. Now it's just X. 
I'm not really sure how that's going to work. Are we really just going to call it X? It's going to be hard to not say Twitter. It's been around for so long and we've been talking about it so much since Elon bought it. But what would we call if it's not Twitter? What are we going to call a tweet? If it's just X, would we call it Twix? I don't know. It's kind of weird. And this just came out of the blue. I didn't even know they were considering changing the name of uh, Twitter to X. Obviously, Elon Musk likes the letter X for some reason. We'll see what uh, we'll see what comes of that. Uh, Okay, we've got some questions coming in. Good. Let's uh, questions for Don later on. So thank you for that. Keep them coming. I have plenty of my own questions. I did prepare pretty well. Um, Don Mann is not only an accomplished Navy SEAL, he's an incredibly accomplished endurance athlete uh, competing in all the crazy, I think if I remember right, he's competed in over a thousand uh, endurance events. And most of these things are extreme. We're not talking about running a marathon here or there. We're talking about double Iron Man's back to back Iron Man's. I can't even imagine uh, some other crazy race um, that can take days, and um, you know the the hundred mile ultra marathons and crazy conditions. Not only has he accomplished all that, he's written an awful lot of books. Uh, he's got a series of fiction books um, about the SEAL team. And he's got a couple of nonfiction books, one of them which we're going to be talking about today. Um, the book we'll be talking about today is really, it, it's got a lot of great stories in it. I absolutely loved all the stories, not just about Navy SEALs either, about uh, a lot of other people who have accomplished incredible things in the world. He tells some great stories in the book. And then it's also kind of a, you know, how to self-help book on achieving just about anything you want to achieve. So check that one out. We'll be talking about that with Don today. Uh, Let's get to some phone calls, find out what's on your mind today. Let's get started in Alabama. Jason, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. Good morning. Hope you're doing well, bud. Um, So I spoke to you a couple weeks ago about my numbers, and it was all jacked up, and you recommended I go ahead and do your profit gauges. So I signed up for that, I, um, and I put in all the numbers. I knuckled down and put in all my numbers. Congratulations. So hopefully, uh, well, thank you. So I was just want you to, uh, if, if you had the time today, to, if you could take a look at it and tell me where I could improve, if my numbers are somewhere in the right ballpark or whatnot. Yeah, let's do this. Let me, um, I'm going to put you back on hold. I'm going to put you back in the queue, and I'm going to have Morgan go get the data for me. If okay. That, all right. Let okay, me, great. Yeah, let me do that. It's it's uh, it's not that difficult to go log in and do all, but I just can't type and talk at the same time. So, um, Morgan, if you could uh, grab that. Oh, I see you already did. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Pennsylvania then. We'll talk to Trevor this morning. Trevor, good morning. Good morning, Kevin. How are you doing? Good. What can I help you with today? Um. Well, today I was... Uh, flying to have you explain to me IFTA and fuel tax. Okay, let me try. This topic is had had become so difficult for me to explain on the air, and I'm not sure why, but it is that I actually created a course. This was one of the weirdest courses, I the way I created it. I actually did it in like 48 hours. I went and parked the coach down by the river and I worked until I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. And then I'd take a nap and then I'd wake up and work. And I just did that around the clock for two days and cranked out this course. So if you don't completely understand it at the end, then there's always the course that will really help. It walks you through all of this stuff step by step so you can really see one of the best ways to, to do this, and I did it in the course, is to actually show a fuel tax report. It, it starts to make more sense. But here's one of the ways I can help you start to understand this. And this is why it's so confusing. When you pull up to the pump to buy fuel, you're not just buying fuel. You are there are multiple transactions going on at the pump and that's the problem. 
you are buying fuel and you are paying tax. There's two different things you're spending money on here. And this is what confuses everybody. The tax, we could separate that out and say, just ignore the tax. And the reason we can ignore the tax is because we can't change it based on how we purchase fuel. People think they can actually change the tax based on where they buy their fuel. You can't. All you can change is how much you're going to owe or get back at the end of the quarter. Nothing else about the tax changes. Your fuel tax is not determined by where you buy fuel. Everybody thinks it is. It's determined by where you drive. So if you determine that the fuel tax rate in Pennsylvania is too high, the only way to avoid that tax is not to drive in Pennsylvania at all. You, you can't avoid the Pennsylvania tax by not buying fuel there. And, and people think that that's how this works. They'll just say, oh, well, I never buy fuel in Pennsylvania. Well, well that's, a, that's an ignorant statement. There are times you should be buying fuel in Pennsylvania, and then there are times you shouldn't. But you have to understand all this to know when. So when you hear these blanket statements, I never buy fuel in Oregon. Well, even Oregon, as goofy as it is, sometimes you should be buying your fuel there. It can change daily and it can even change in the middle of the day if somebody changes their fuel price changes the whole equation on where we should buy our fuel so if you always want to know that you're getting the best deal on fuel possible that you're buying the cheapest fuel you have to go check every single time you want to buy fuel but it's worth it because once you understand this just understanding where to buy your fuel can save you about $2,000 a year. And it's not in tax. It's saving Nothing. you on the fuel cost itself. Right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good at the end of the year. Two grand in fuel if you know where and when to buy fuel. It, it's a big deal. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a way to put savings to the bottom line without really spending any money to do it. You just have to invest some time to learn this. And once you learn it, checking your fuel prices, there's several tools we can use. It really doesn't take long at all. It adds a couple of minutes to your trip planning, but it can save a lot of money. Here, here's why. Here's what we have to do. Remember, we're when we pull up to the pump, we're buying two different things. We're buying fuel, but they're, we're also paying for tax. And here's where it gets confusing every state has a different tax rate so you can't look at a pump price and make a comparison on your trip but that's what everybody does if they do anything most people do nothing they just drive around and when they need fuel they stop and get fuel they have no planning whatsoever the few people that do plan seem to plan based on the pump price which is completely wrong you can't do that. If you're looking at a pump price in Pennsylvania with a really high fuel tax, and then you're looking at maybe, oh, I don't know, Missouri, I think traditionally is very low. You can't compare the pump prices. And what you have to do is you have to go look up a price. Let's say we were comparing Pennsylvania and Missouri. We're going to be in those two states today, and we could buy fuel in either state. What we would do is we would go find the cheapest pump price in those states, and then we would subtract the fuel tax out of each one. Now that the fuel tax is out of there, how much are we really paying for the fuel? Now we buy the cheapest fuel price with the tax taken out. Does that seem pretty simple? It does. It sounds like it's a little bit of work to figure all that out, but if you're saving money at the end of the day, it's probably worth doing for a yeah. lot of folks. Yeah. It, it, and the fact that it's that simple, I, I can give people the answer. The answer always is always when you're buying fuel, you compare pump prices minus the fuel tax in that state. That's how we compare fuel prices. Then you buy the cheapest fuel with the tax taken out. That's the whole answer. There are no exceptions. So, so if I say that, this should be simple. What screws people up is, and I don't disagree with this, you should want to know why. 
Well, why do I do that? And I can explain, and my course explains it. It's when we start explaining the why that everybody gets all screwed up. They start thinking there's exceptions somehow where somebody will tell them, oh no, I don't know where you heard that, but that's all wrong. I promise you it's not wrong. It is 100% correct. And if you never want to learn about all of this, you don't have to. Just trust that that formula works and it works every time. But when I used to say that, people would call me back in a couple weeks and we'd be talking about fuel tax and they'd be like, well, I, I was doing that, but then this guy told me that, that I should buy my fuel always here. No, 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 no. Anytime you hear those statements, never buy fuel here, always buy fuel here, you know they're wrong. None of those statements make sense. The way you get the cheapest fuel is you compare prices at the pump with the tax taken out in each state. So the first thing to do is get yourself a list of all the state tax rates. They're easy to find. Uh, we have a link on our website that will get you to a chart. Um, there are tools out there. ProMiles is one of them. Uh, you can get subscriptions and apps that will do a lot of this work for you. Uh, but it really is worth doing it. Okay. So that kind of helps uh, you explain it to me. Good. So it's just stuff to think about because I know, I know I'm going to have to go coming out of New York. My only two choices coming out of New York to the rest of the states is usually either Pennsylvania or New Jersey, and I'd rather go through Pennsylvania, honestly. So it's all stuff well, I kind of have to look at. Well, like I said, the only way you could ever change the amount of fuel tax you paid would be to drive through a different state. That's almost never an right. option. Never. I mean, in our business, it, it just really doesn't work out that way. So you should just forget that whole point. Ignore the fuel tax side of it. Okay. All we're trying to accomplish is getting the absolute lowest price on fuel. And it, if you do what I just said, okay. it works every time. If you start to do what I say and somebody says, no, that's wrong, go take the course. And then you'll be able to look at them and go, no, it's not wrong. Here's why. But you don't need okay. to. If you just want to trust the system, you can just trust the system and it will work. Okay. Well, that helps a lot, Kevin. Um, I did uh, read another book. It was um, Seeing What's Next. did that. It was about uh, market disruptions and how to identify them and how to counter them and use them to your advantage. And Pretty good book. I had to kind of listen to it twice because I didn't completely understand it the first time through. Uh, you know, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a skill I struggle with. I love reading. I love learning from books. There are so many books I should have gone back through. I have a hard time with that. I always want to get on to the next book. Uh, and I, I, I should, you know, I don't like repetition, but repetition is the only way you really learn a skill. Um, that, that's a weak spot for me. Always has been. I always want to get on to the next book and I should take more time. I've been getting better at it lately getting better at just taking my time with the book, going back over things. Uh, it's incredible what you can learn the second and third time. Right. Well, usually when it comes to reading or listening to something, I'll, I'll listen to it or read it a couple times so I understand it. Where, where I usually kind of fall off, and I'm getting better at this, is asking questions. I, growing up, I always sucked at asking questions, but I'm getting, I'm getting better at it. Um, the, the, asking questions is a really valuable skill. I'll tell you the, the world champion, in my opinion, in asking questions, Bruce Mallinson. I've hung out with Bruce. We've, you know, spent a lot of time together. We've been on vacations. We've been in situations totally away from trucking. I have never seen anybody more curious than Bruce. Bruce will ask anybody anything. And it's incredible what he learns. Okay, well, yeah, I, I like asking you questions because you've, you've gone out, you've done all the hard work and got a lot of the experience in it. It's a little easier for me to ask you and get the information than it is for me to go out and try to find it on my own. And, yeah. and if I go out and find it on my own, I might get the wrong information. Which is one of the biggest problems facing us today. It's not a lack of information by any stretch of the imagination. Our biggest challenge today is too much information and how do you figure out not only what's right, but what's best. What's the optimal way of doing something? And, and finding that in all the information today is one of our biggest challenges. Yeah, it's why I like to go find someone who's got a lot more experience and who knows what they're talking about. Like you, Kevin, you know 
a lot more about the trucking industry because you've been in it a lot longer than I have. And going to talking to you, I can get the right information the first time instead of going out and getting the wrong information and learning that it was wrong information and possibly having a, uh, a really expensive mistake. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do, I, I do use the philosophy that, um, I personally learn better from my successes or from my failures than I do my successes. Although that's a question I've got for our, uh, our guest today, because he talks about that. I, I tend to yep. really learn quickly from failures. I don't learn quite so well from successes. So um, when I'm trying something new or, you know, I've got a new idea or a new project for the for the company or whatever it might be, I actually try to make as many mistakes as I can as fast as I can, because that's how I learn. But I, I try to make sure I don't make big enough mistakes that they're really going to cause problems. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'll go out and make the mistakes and learn from it real quick. But I've kind of gotten to the point where it's like, well, there's plenty of people out there who've already made the mistakes, and why should I make the mistake and I can go and talk to them who's already made the mistake and learn from their lessons that they've learned from making that mistake? It saves me a lot of time and a lot less effort of fixing a mistake that someone else has already gone out and done. Absolutely. All right, Trevor, good stuff. Um, like I said, oh, I just found yeah. out uh, we are in, in transition mode with our courses and our websites. The, we have now made the fuel tax course free uh, for tribe members. Right now, you actually have to be a member of Healthy Tribe. We're moving all of our courses into there first, then we'll do the merge with the two sites. Um, so if you are a member of Healthy Tribe, you can go take that fuel tax course free. If you're not, you can join Healthy Tribe for three bucks a month. So why wouldn't you? All right, uh, we've got some calls on the line, but we've also got our guest on. So I think I'm gonna go to our guest early. Um, I wanna make sure we uh, can get to him as quick as possible here. So um, with no further ado, I wanna welcome in Don Mann. Don, welcome. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing? Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for, uh, first off, thank you for um, an incredible lifetime of service to our country and uh, everything you've done to keep us all safe. Uh, I appreciate it. I know the whole tribe does. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, and when thank I you. say an incredible lifetime, um, that's really what your life has been. It's been um, about service and service to our country, but just uh, just such an incredible story. So, um, I, you know, when I look at your list of accomplishments, I wrote down some notes here on how to introduce you, and I don't even know where to start. Um, everything you've accomplished as a SEAL, which just being on a SEAL team is a huge accomplishment, but you've gone way above and beyond that and, and taken that to another level. But then your, your incredible endurance uh, career with the, I think I saw over a thousand uh, endurance events. And we're talking some pretty extreme stuff. I wanna hear uh, some of the stories about that. And then above and beyond that, um, you're also a pretty incredible author with a, a lot of books. I'd love to read. Reading is a big topic here for us on the show. Books are a big topic. Uh, so I want to talk about that as well. So we have an awful lot of things to cover today. Oh, well, well thanks. And thanks for having me on your show. So uh, where do I want to start? Let's start with this. Um, I was going to save this for later, but since I already mentioned books and we do love reading here, um, what is your favorite book that you wrote? Well, I would have to say it would be Reaching Beyond Boundaries. Good. That's and <laughs> and the reason I say that is because I was able to uh, speak to and, and talk to a lot of people who I've known in my life that uh, has been a great influence on me and, and some, some legends I've never met, but they've also been a big influence on me. And I've taken their lessons and combined them with some of my own lessons I've learned on how to get more out of yourself and how to reach beyond your own boundaries, your own self-perceived limits. And, um, and I've learned a lot from putting that book together. And I've written novels and nonfiction fiction and how-to books and historical books but this was my favorite project, putting that book together. And, and when I do talks around the country, those talks come from that book. And um, 
audiences really seem to to like the lessons I, I share with them in the talks that come from that book. Well, I, I read the book uh, this last week, and I can ex- absolutely see that. I mean, I, I can see the I, I love the stories. And what you just mentioned actually took me a little by surprise. When I look at your accomplishments, I mean, crazy stuff. We'll talk a little bit about it. I, I didn't even know there was somebody crazy enough to try running back-to-back Ironmans. Um so uh, pretty incredible stuff, but uh, the stories are amazing. I love the stories in that book. And I love the fact that you have so many mentors. That was a little shocking to me. I'm like, wow, when wow, you can accomplish everything this guy's accomplished, who do you look up to? But you did an, an awesome job of really highlighting some people that I had heard of, kind of knew what they did, but not to the depth and the level that you described in this book. So that was really a big part of why I enjoyed this book so much, but reading the stories and then reading what it was and who it was that inspired you. Yeah, well, thanks. You know, um, I, I realized as a young man, a young boy, actually, that I needed someone to look up to. And um, I, I, the, the person I look up to the most in the sports world, for instance, would be Reinhold Mesner, who's the greatest climber of all time. And, you know, he, he, he might look at those thousand or so competitions I put together and raced and, and competed in throughout my lifetime. And, he, and some of those are big, 500, 600 mile nonstop <laughs> races. Yeah. And, um, and, and they were the biggest ones in the world, but he might look at that and say, well, yeah, I see you like doing those little things and running around the parks and all. Here's what I do. I, I pick up a backpack and I go climb some mountain that's never, ever been climbed before. I look at the north face of it, the, the extreme side of it, and I go up and I climb it solo without oxygen. And I tell my friends and family I should be home in a couple of months. So when I look at a person like that, I realize he has tapped into this energy source that we all have. But he really knows how to dig deep and tap into that. And, and now he's earned the reputation of the greatest mountaineer the world will ever know because of his attitude and I, I love his attitude and people like that and, and and they inspire me you know another another woman you know we did this very difficult climb once in the Grand Tetons and I did it with some great mountaineers and seals and uh, we came down we're proud of proud of ourselves it was only a, a two-day climb but we did it in one day and it was a pretty bad storm and uh, we all felt good about ourselves up until we saw a woman come down who wasn't really a mountaineer and she wasn't that fit and she was completely blind and she did the same thing. Wow. And it's really people <laughs> like that who, who inspire me, people like that. It's just, like I said, yeah. incredible story. So I, I highly recommend uh, starting with this book. I'm glad I started with this one. Uh, I'm also reading one of the, uh, the uh, fiction uh, on SEAL teams. I love those kind of stories as well. So uh, so now that is your favorite book that you wrote. Um, what's your favorite book overall? I know that's hard for people who read a lot and write a lot, but do you have a favorite book? Can you put one at the top? I, I think I do. Um, and it was a movie as well. And it was, it's called Unbroken. And it's a, um, my, my life similar to his in a much, much, much smaller way. And we both were young boys who were getting in trouble here and there and had this energy and it was a little bit reckless and we got in trouble and we both got into running. But where it differed, he went to the Olympics in 1936 and he broke a record in the Olympics. And it was uh, during Hitler was in the audience and Hitler said, I want to meet that young man. And where else it differed, he went in the military during World War II, and um, he was a, he was just on a crew on a flight, and, and they got shot down. And, you know, I like survival. I've taught survival schools. I've been on survival situations myself. But where else this was different is where he did survive on a life raft longer than anybody else ever to that time period. And then, you know, I've, I've been through POW uh, schools. I've, I've been captured before. I've been waterboarded before, but that was nothing compared to what this guy went through. Louis Zamborini is his name. He was captured by the Japanese and tortured and almost executed. And um, 
So I look at a guy like him and all he's been through. To me, he had a completely full life with adventures. And he, he devoted his life to the military. And then he, he, then he became um, very, very, he had, he had difficulties when he came home after experiencing all that. He, he started drinking quite a bit. And that really was a downfall for him up until he recovered from all that. And he, he said that was the hardest part of his life. So all the difficulties he went through, it was well written in this book called Unbroken. And I, I look at him and I think, you know, look at all he's achieved and then look at all the hardships he had to go through. And he still prevailed. And I think the last big run he did, he ran part of a marathon in his 90s. Wow. So I love that book. And I love yeah. all he did as, a, as a, an American patriot and uh, as an athlete. And I just uh, look look up to him in a great, great deal of respect. Well, you, you just made my day. I'd love when I ask for a book recommendation and I get a book I've never read. And I haven't read this one. Now I'm really looking oh. forward to it. Yeah, Louis Zambrini was the person saying, man, it's all, it's all, you know, it's all nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it. you mentioned, you know, your your younger days, and um, I, I was a little shocked, you know, when I read about your accomplishments at first and, you know, becoming a SEAL and then, you know, moving even beyond that. You know, in my mind, I, I think about the people who achieve things like that. Usually, um, you kind of assume they are just so squared away with everything in their life. You know, they're just disciplined and they, um, they've they got the motivation and the energy and they're, they're usually super achievers in everything. Like you assume they're going to be, you know, a, a sports star in high school, probably, you know, maybe class president, uh, you know, top of the class grades. It's kind of what you expect. If somebody's going to go on to achieve those kind of things, that's not really your story though. Um, and, and it's interesting. I'm not <laughs> trying to make any comparisons, but I, I kind of had the same experience in high school. I got a kick out of when you talked about, you know, getting your books in your locker on the first day, putting your books in the locker, <laughs> never taking them out. And then at the end of the year, forgetting which locker it was. Um, I had a similar experience. I got called down to the principal's office about skipping a certain class on Friday. They were asking me, why weren't you in class on Friday? And I actually looked at him and said, Friday? I haven't been there this entire semester. We were like eight weeks into the semester. I hadn't been to that class once. And they were finally asking me about it. So um, it, you weren't like a super achiever as a child or a student. Well, you know, you're, you're right. You're 100% right on that for sure. I, it, it took me up to, in seventh grade, I realized my life was going to go one or two directions. I was either going to go toward music because I really have a great passion for music and maybe be a musician or it was going to be in the sports world. And somehow I had the sense to realize that I didn't have any talent and maybe I should just listen to music and not try to play it. <laughs> and then maybe devote my life to something like adventurous and, and, and fitness wise and, and, and in sports. And my father was a real patriot. He's a real patriot. He quit high school as soon as we got attacked, you know, and the Japanese attacked Okinawa, um, Hawaii. He, he quit high school, so did his two brothers and sister, and they all joined the military. My grandparents had four stars up on their window because they all joined the military. So I knew my life was going to be military, adventure, sports, and fitness related. And back then, I didn't use these terms, but that was my macro goal, to try to make my life, starting in seventh grade, and, and to fill those four needs. It's got to be patriotic. It's got to be serving our country. It's got to be fitness, really. It's got to be a lot of adventure in there. And um, so when I find it, so I worked out all the time from seventh grade on without a clear goal. Where my reckless behavior began, it's because the adventure was, it was a lot of fun for us to be riding on mini bikes and motorcycles <laughs> before we had licenses and being chased by the police. It oh was, my. It was yeah. exciting and it's adventurous. A- 
So that was the next part of the story. I, I just I, loved it. I was going to say we, we had some similarities. I got my first mini bike when I was six, and I raced motocross up until I was 16 and then started riding bikes on the street, which uh, was a mistake. But I, I the place we used yeah. to ride was totally, you know, marked everywhere, no trespassing. It was an old sand and gravel pit. And not only was I chased by the cops out of there most weeks, um, one of the cops that chased me out was my brother-in-law. He happened to be a cop in town. He would chase me out occasionally. Um, so, since we touched on motocross and you were pretty into it for a while there, what bike did you ride? Well, I actually got a sponsorship. It was just a local sponsorship by Suzuki. So I had a, uh, I had 125, a 250, and an open bike. And back then it was the RM370. RM250 and RM125. I, I remember it really well. I had an RM100 and then a 125. So we we were, I was maybe four or five years behind you there. That was back, remember, all the European bikes were really popular first. I had a couple of those too, like the Makos and Husqvarna's and, and bikes like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Interesting stuff. I had stuff. a Husky 250, yeah. Yeah, I had a... <laughs> and a Montessa. I had a Montessa 250. That one I almost forgot about, Montessa. I had a bull taco. Yeah, me too, until Remember just those? Now. Yeah, I know. When you said Montessa, I'm like, oh, well, sure. I haven't heard that name in a long time. No, no, and bull taco, same thing. I haven't heard that name in a long time. Yeah, yeah, crazy stuff. Um, here's a. Uh, we've got some questions coming in from our our listeners as well. Uh, let me get back and find that one because. I thought this was a really good question. Um, I've got notes everywhere and they're coming at me from all directions. Uh, here's one, I like this. And you actually just talked about this. We, we actually spend quite a bit of time on this show talking about being prepared, being prepared for everything, being prepared in business, being prepared with your health and, and your money and uh, just kind of life in general, just being prepared for what might happen in our world today. Um, you had talked about survival and survival training. Um, if you could pick one survival skill that, that you would start with, what would that be? Well, um, the number one, in, in my opinion, and I would never ever say anything different to answer this, would be to have a very powerful and strong mindset. And um, that has to be the first step. And, and when I say that, I, I don't mean to make the answer sound too simplistic, but no. uh, when you have the right mindset and you know you're going to survive and you know you can beat anything that comes your way, uh, you have to have the attitude that you're going you're gonna to win and you're going to prevail. And so when they, the, this country, the way it's going right now, you know, I, I think about it all the time. I think of all the things that possibly could go wrong. And I don't stay awake and I'm not paranoid right, about it, right. but I know things can go wrong at some point. But I'm, I'm also very, very, very confident and positive that I'll be okay because of mindset. And I think the mindset has to be number one. And then it can be broken down into steps after that with finances and food and water and protection, you know, home survival and protecting yourself and your family. It should be broken down in steps after that. But the mindset, which can be strengthened each and every day, has to and Step number one. I, I, I absolutely love that answer. And that's really what the book is all about. I th in the book, you refer to it as a combat mindset, right? Yeah, you know, and I shouldn't always use the word combat mindset. And that's what we call it in the field teams, having in the military in general, having a combat mindset that you're going to win no matter what. You're going to prevail. You might get injured, but you're going to heal up and you're still going to win the fight. In civilian life, it's just strengthening your own mindset. But it's, um, I shouldn't always use the word combat mindset because people against the military or against combat are not for it or think they don't have anything to do with that. It, a better term would be just strengthening your own mindset, I think. Yeah, I, I like that because it really does cover it. Trying to pick, like, you, you know, you say the the survival skill. There's so many of them. Trying to pick one that's most important. I, I think you really did get it. It's not what we might think of as a physical skill. Um, and again, you, you talk about this a lot more in the book. So I encourage people to get it. Um, this is a great uh, approach to this. That 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 mindset. And I think about some of your stories. And you know, I talk a lot about whether it's money or business or or anything we might do. I've always believed that. 
you can't know where the limit is unless you break the limit. I mean, that's the only way to learn what, what some limits are. And um, you talk about in the book, some of it's pretty extreme. I mean, the ability to push your body past its breaking point. You've experienced that a couple of times. That, that's pretty incredible to even be able to do that. I can't imagine what that feels like at the end when you, you blacked out during an endurance event, right? Yep, on numerous occasions. But, you know, Kevin, so, so um, and, and if I'm not careful, people might hear this and think I'm some whack job or something. <laughs> but, and like, for, and, and like, in and field training and BUDS, and BUDS training, which is the toughest military training in the world, um, it's difficult. I went there prepared. I was ready for it. I was ready to take it on. I looked at the instructors with humility and I was humble and modest, but I looked at them like I welcome the pain. I know this is going to hurt, but anything worth doing, just welcome the pain and I will give everything I have to, to, to finish this course. And that's how I looked at each and every day. And every day I'd get home and think, my God, today was really, really hard. Not as hard as I envisioned. So I, I did a lot of... <laughs> you know, um, human mental conditioning. And, and um, I, I, I pictured how hard each and every day would be. And I trained h- harder than I know anybody to train for. And when I went there as prepared, as prepared as I could be, but, and every day was hard, but it wasn't hard as I imagined it would be. And I think that the visualization, a lot of athletes call that visualization, that visualization process can help you in almost anything and it helped in that. But what it did do is, okay, yeah, I made it through buds. That was fine. But then when I went on and did these long endurance events called adventure racing, where you might go travel 500 to 600 miles in the mountains and the Himalayas or the jungles of somewhere or the deserts of somewhere. And you're doing it with a team of four or five people it was very, very common to people to start pushing themselves so hard in these events where you start hallucinating, bonking, passing out, or bleeding. And, and, and what you said earlier is I really felt that if I wasn't pushing my team to these limits or if I didn't myself bleed, bonk, pass out, or hallucinate, I wasn't giving it my all. <laughs> and I learned the lesson. It took me a long time to learn that lesson, but I, I caused damage to my body doing that for over 20 years and, and pushing people that hard. It, now I realize you don't go over that self-perceived line. We have to know what's too much. And, and I always felt like if I didn't go beyond the line of being too much, I was leaving too much at home, too much on the table, and I could be giving it my all. And then when I was bleeding, passing out, or bonking, or hallucinating, I knew I gave it my all. And that was my gauge. But <laughs> yeah. now I, I think it's much, much smarter just to go up and touch that line, don't overdo it, then back up. And not only in the physical world, but even in a marriage or working at a bank or an automobile industry or trucking industry or, or the medical industry, if you give too, too much and you go over that self-perceived line, something's going to happen, maybe with a relationship at home, maybe not giving enough time or attention to other things that need it. But if you give too, too much, something else is going to break. And now I, I, I learned, and I'm a slow learner, it took over 20 years of doing this. Now I think, you know, focus where that line's going to be and go up and just touch it. And right before you go over the line, back off. So and, it's a, and and never give up on going after that big goal, but don't go over the line and make something I, else in your life or a break. I, I love that lesson. I was talking to a caller right before we brought you on, and I kind of alluded to the same idea that, you know, I, I know myself, I tend to learn better from my mistakes than I do my successes. Uh, and you cover that in the book. I want to come back to that. But so I, I got to this point where I started intentionally making mistakes early on when I wanted to learn something new or try something new. And and the goal was always to make a, a big enough mistake that I really learned a lesson and learned it well, but not such a big mistake that it was a setback. You know, whether it was my health or my business, I didn't want to make a big enough mistake that it really set me back and I had to try to recover from it. But you want to, like you said, kind of find that line. When when can I get close to that line so I know where it is without really going too far beyond? 
You know, and I was listening to uh, your, your show, and I heard you talk and give that answer. I love the way you, you did that. And, and I, I recently went to a uh, U.S. Naval Academy graduation, and the Secretary of Defense was there giving a speech. And that was what he was talking about. He was telling these young Naval Academy graduates, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Push yourself beyond, he didn't use these words, beyond boundaries, but push yourself and go ahead and make mistakes because you'll learn much, much more from those mistakes than you will if you don't make the mistakes. And also teaching our young leaders to try things and push it. And not everything will be successful because if everything is successful, you're not really pushing it too much. You're kind of staying in a box that's already been created and, and you're not going to expand beyond that. And so I, I like the way you answered the, the listeners' uh, question, and then um, it, it kind of echoed what the you know um, I heard at the Naval Academy. It was just the same thing, and I believe in that yeah. so much as well. Yeah, you know, um, you talk about the in the book. You talk about the skill of learning from your successes, uh, and, and that caught my attention. I thought, you know, I, I don't do that well. I, I've, I've focused on learning from my mistakes, and it, it's. It served me well, but I could also learn a lot from focusing on what I can learn from my successes. How do you do that in your life? Well, in my life, you know, I'm old. <laughs> so I've had a lot of years to uh, get this down a little bit. But um, in my life, the things that worked out well for me in life, uh, which I believe is training, mentoring other people, pushing hard in athletic events, um, things like that. The things that have worked out really well for me are things I just have a real passion for. And and I know to stick to the things that worked out well for me and because it makes me happy doing it, for one. And, and I, I'm good at doing those certain things. And so the success is I try to build on and try to get better and better at the things I've had success doing. Yeah, it, what it sounds like to me is it, it really isn't any more complicated than just deciding to focus on those successes and learn from them. And I guess that's just what I, I, I didn't take that step. I, you know, I, I did it with my mistakes, but I could have just as easily said, let's, after we have a success, let's stop a minute, uh, you know, celebrate the success. But then what did we learn from it? You know, what can we learn to, so that we can continue um, those kind of successes as well? So I love that. You know, one of the other lessons you talk about, oh, uh, let me go back a second. I know there's another thought I wanted to get to. Let me let me get to this one. You talked about macro and micro goals. Uh, again, we, we talk a lot about that. There's a lot of different ways of looking at goal setting. Um, I think you really simplified it with this. With, with the, when you talk about macro goals, these are the ones that should really kind of make you uncomfortable, right? Yes. You know, it's... It, um, I just got off the phone with my daughter, and and she had some questions for me, and that's what we talked about: micro and macro goal setting. And and I could honestly say I don't think I would have gone anywhere in life if two things hadn't happened. First, the combat mindset, or my mindset. I I try each and every day to make that stronger and stronger and more powerful. But second, I had to have these goals, and and I got the term from Lance Armstrong you know, the disgraced cyclist, but still he was a great athlete. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, and I got the term <laughs> and, um, and it was the macro goal. And then I just took it a little, I took it very seriously what a macro goal was. And, um, and I doing this all my life and, and really it's just, where do you want to go? What do you want to do in life? No matter how big or outrageous or challenging it might be to set it as a macro goal. And then the next step is, you know, that could be, like for me, it was to be a SEAL or to do two Ironman competitions in one day or to, to go in the CIA or, or, or maybe do a thousand competitions, you know, before a certain date. But it would be some huge accomplishment that, or to even write a book was a macro goal at one point. Now I've written 22 books. <laughs> And I wasn't a writer. I, I just barely made it through English um, in high school. But yeah, I just have these macro goals where, okay, what do you want to do? And I set that way, way, way up high. And then a series of micro goals on how to get to that macro goal. Like, for instance, I wanted to run a marathon. So the marathon was a macro goal. So the micro goals were 5K races, 10K races, 
you know, eventually a half marathon, then the ma- then the marathon. But then, not to stop there, then take that macro goal, bring it down to the micro goal level, and the next macro goal has to be more challenging. So for me, the next macro goal is, okay, let's do a double marathon. Let's do two marathons, <laughs> an ultra marathon. Yeah. And so my macro goal would be the ultra marathon, and, and now my micro goals would be a marathon here, a marathon there, the marathon's got to be faster than the last one. And then, then I hit the macro goal, and then then I take that macro goal of two I'll bring it down to the micro goal level because my next one is I want to do 500 miles and um, and, and it never stops and as a writer maybe times asked me to write a sports article back in the early 80s and I was thinking oh my god I don't know how to write an article I don't know how to do that my macro right. goal was just to write a sports article on how to stay in shape for people in the Navy and the Marines who wanted to read it and that was my macro goal then I finished that and I brought that back down to the micro goal level and then i was asked to write a book on the the topic of adventure racing because i was competing at the world-class level i was teaching people how to race and i was producing these races and a politician from virginia asked me name's quentin kidd he asked me why don't you write a book you're the only person who races at this level produces races and teaches people i said quentin i don't want to write a book i don't want to write a book I don't want to be behind a computer. He said, I'll tell you what, you give me all the material on recordings and I'll have it uh, typed up for you. So then my next macro goal was to write a book. Boom, that I got. I wrote the book. Then the next macro goal was to write a, um, a series. And then the next macro goal was, you know, so that went on and on and on. I just took the macro goal that was accomplished, right. bring it down to the micro goal level. And now, now, um, it, you know, now I've, an, an accomplished author because of just that and that's without being an author without being a writer really but just setting a macro goal up high okay so, first it's the article then it's the series and then it just went on and on from there and I, every aspect of my life it's worked for macro goal as a big 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 picture and then setting up a series of micro goals to reach that big picture you know, you really explain it well as a system, and I think it's also a great example of when we ask the question about which skill was most important. You, you really, you admit it, you didn't have any skills as a writer, you didn't want to be a writer, you didn't want to go through what it took to write a book, but what you had was that mindset. You had the mindset that said, wait a minute, yeah. if, this, if this is important enough, and, and I, I really see that you are a, an educator and you want to share this stuff, and, and books are a great way to do that, so I could see you, you, your your mindset was what allowed you to accomplish this. It's really what allows you to accomplish everything. It is that mindset first, then you saw this was important, so you set that goal, and then 22 books later, that that's pretty incredible. Yep, and, and, that, and really, it wasn't talent, and it wasn't um, anything that I had um, any gift for doing, it's just, I set it as a goal and I had the mindset I was going to accomplish the goal. There's only those two things that, that made it possible. You know, the, these two topics we're touching on goal setting and books and education and knowledge. They're, they're big topics here. And I try to get across to my listeners. Most of our audience by far drives a truck for a living. We do a lot of health stuff. So we've picked yeah. up some people outside of the industry, but primarily I always I always approach this show that I'm talking to people that drive trucks for a living. Some of them own the truck they drive. It's a pretty unique uh, experience. But one of the things I try to get across to them, in my opinion, truck drivers should be some of the most educated um, and accomplished people in our country. Here's why. Think about their what, what their what they can do. Let's talk about goal setting first off, the micro and macro goals. That's what these guys do every day. I try to get across to them that the skills you have to get freight delivered are exactly the same skills we're talking about setting goals. You pick up a load and you're in New Jersey and the load's going to Southern California. That's a macro goal. Now, how many micro goals do you need to get there? Because that's all you're doing when you're planning these trips. Every day when you're delivering freight, you're using that same goal setting process you could be using in your life. You should be really good at this. And then the next huge advantage they have, um, most truck drivers should have the equivalent of a PhD in something or several things. They, they drive 60 hours in seven days. 
And for most of them, that's not enough. One of the biggest complaints in the industry is they're limited to that 60 hours in seven days. They're not allowed to work more than that. And that's a problem. They would work more if we let them. But that's 60 hours of being able to listen to audiobooks and learn every week. Yeah, I, I, I totally, I, I, I think about that actually quite a bit when I'm driving down the highway and we go to a truck stop and, and you get to meet, I get to meet some of the truckers and I've got friends who become truckers who absolutely love it. And, and I, I always look at them as, look at these people. They are, they are, they are working hard. And it's so, you know, a lot of people think people in the military for serving our country. There's other ways to serve our country and, and truckers do it each and every day. If there wasn't our great truckers and our, our trucking systems and, and and the trucking industry, we wouldn't have a country. And um, so they, they do a lot for our country. So they're patriots, for one. And, and they love our country. They see more of it than most of us do. And also, I agree with you. If, um, I, 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 I have uh, two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree and never attended college. I never, well, I, I shouldn't yeah. say never. I did take yeah. some classes. Right. But um, right. 95% of the schooling was done either in tents and airplanes, uh, traveling. And I would sign up. I'd say, I'd like to take your course, but I'm in the military and I'm gone all the time. But I promise you, I'll get the work done. And all my learning and education I received was in times like where I could be driving down the road in the truck. In my case, it was on a ship or a boat or. Right a plane or a jet going somewhere. But uh, yeah, they could be the most educated people, the most worldly people in our country because of what they do. And I, and I have a feeling probably a lot of them do that because how often, what are you going to do? You're just going to not expand your mind, perhaps? You could be doing a lot of mind expansion through self-help books oh, on yeah. audio books. You can learn so much about the U.S. history. Look, any any of your hobby you have, boy, what a great yeah. time to do it. Learn Not another language. Country. Yeah. I like Learn another language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All kinds of great yep. stuff. All right. I, I know our time is, is coming short here, and I want to respect your time. Do you have a couple more minutes for us? Oh, absolutely, Kevin. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one more question I had, and then I think I've got a couple questions from uh, our listeners as well. Uh, I know you can't talk a lot about details sometimes on some of this kind of stuff, but of... of <laughs> How long were you a SEAL, by the way? I'm pretty sure I read this, but I want to make sure I get it right. How long were you actively serving as a SEAL? Well, I was military 21 years, and before I could go to SEAL team, I was a medic, and you had to serve in some capacity, either with the Marines or a ship. And so I chose the Marines. And so my, of my 21 years as a SEAL, just under 18 years, excluding boot camp and uh, yeah. medical training and serving with the Marines incredible during that time what was the most memorable mission the one that that really just jumps out and again i know you can't sometimes give us a lot of details but what what mission really sticks out for you the one that sticks out to me the most is um i, I was captured and held at gunpoint overnight and was told i was going to be shot in the back and um i was with three other guys and um and, you know, these people are scared to death. They had us surrounded, and they were, we were in the middle of them, four of us, and a whole bunch of them with their fingers on the triggers ready to shoot us. And we shouldn't have been where we were. And um, I, I love that that happened because we were sitting in a hole for three days buried with a, some netting over our heads so we could do a reconnaissance mission. And we were all really, really sick and we all had diarrhea and were vomiting and urinating in our own hole that we're hiding in and every high tide that hole filled with water oh. so we're living in our sewage i got ivs and the other three guys they couldn't get one in me i was a medic but um you know what i love about that we we got away um nobody thought we were gonna lose we all knew we were gonna win and um, nobody complained. And so when I hear people complaining of their job or their home or their work or something, I always go back to stories like that. You know, like I was with three guys. None of them complained. How does work wow. get any worse than that? <laughs> yeah. we, were, we were happy to be there. We were happy and we were surrounded by people who were like-minded, who, who were um, very positive. And boy, talk about a combat mindset. Uh, it was there for sure, all of us. 
I, I was just about to say that that is the ultimate test of that kind of mindset. I, I, I can't even imagine um, what that had to be like. You, you know, there is one more topic I want to talk about. Uh, we deal a lot with health. Uh, truck drivers' health is horrendous. The job is just awful when it comes to health for so many reasons. It doesn't have to be. And that, that's what we've learned over the last eight or nine years we've helped drivers with health. There are a lot of ways we can improve their condition. One of the things we noticed though, we've been helping drivers lose weight and get healthy and get fit, you know, for nine years now. And right around the middle of 2020, we started noticing a pattern that, that people we had worked with for years and had really made improvements in their health, they were starting to backslide. And we thought, all right, they've just kind of gotten out of the routine. Maybe their diet slipped a little bit or, and it, and it turned out it wasn't. That wasn't the case. They, were, they hadn't really changed anything. And yet we were seeing these signs of deteriorating health. People were starting to go backwards and they had made all these gains. Yeah, and we finally realized um, after doing enough consultations and talking to people that it was just purely stress. Um, 2020, the world kind of fell apart and, you know, trucking was really crazy. These guys were out there every day. They never really quit. They can't. Um, you mentioned earlier, if the truck drivers aren't working, uh, all of us have a huge problem. So they never quit. And, you know, when, when we thought COVID was really dangerous and these guys were out there on the front lines and they're traveling all over the country in and out of hot spots. Um, so we realized that, that the world had gotten very stressful and we figured out that, you know, we've got to help them with this. And our first approach was trying to avoid stress, you know, more meditation, more mindfulness, more time off, you know, go be with your family and go take a walk in the woods. All those things were good advice, but they weren't working. So as, as much as we believed in them, they just weren't working and I couldn't figure out why. And I did a lot of testing and I, in, in your book, you mentioned the Navy using HRV. We use HRV a lot here. I kind of know it inside and out. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was mm -hmm. that stress for us, I, I, I came to this conclusion that stress is kind of like a muscle that we can actually, you know, I, I couldn't run a marathon if I tried right now. But I also I know that I could go train my muscles and my heart, my cardiovascular system, and then I could run a marathon. And I started looking at stress right. the same right. way. We're, we're not handling these stressful situations at all and avoiding them isn't doing us any good. The minute we're back in the stress, we fall apart again. And I realize stress is like a muscle. We have to strengthen this to be able to endure that stress without kind of falling apart. Yeah, and I started working on things that would improve and strengthen our stress muscle. And what it turns out, you'll appreciate this, literally everything we have to do to build that stress muscle is really, really uncomfortable. Like we, we have got to put ourselves through some, through discomfort in order to build that. Things like cold exposure, I'm sure you've experienced crazy extremes there. Heat exposure and, and some infrared sauna stuff and, you know, really intense short duration resistance training and then some breath work. We actually um, modeled a lot of our breath work after the Wim Hof method. But, uh, but all of those things really putting your body into these short term intense periods of discomfort is how we were able to build that stress muscle. And that, that's really, I mean, you've taken that really to its ultimate. Well, you know, I, I, I totally agree with everything you just said on stress. I, 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 I have worked with U.S. Marshals for a number of years, and that was one of the topics I was uh, I, I was on on them about was stress. Um, they they go in against MS-13 people, and and um, they, they 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 go up and they have these meetings in MS-13. Then they they drive home. And they're worried the MS-13 people are going to find out where they live and and families have been executed and homes burnt down. So they're so stressed all the time. Everything they do. Um, so everything you said, the breathing methods, listening to music, they're all stress reduces, um, and, and thinking of ways to exercise the stress muscle. Um, I had a friend just call me the other day, and he's in a, under a lot of stress. He saw a young girl. He was killed by the ISIS uh, terrorist organization, and he said, now I've got a girl that age, and I, I, I'm so stressed out. I picture my daughter, and I picture what happened to that girl. And, and I had a tell him, I said, Travis, 
this is a, a, a dangerous world. I mean, all every generation before us has faced terrible, stressful times. Every generation after us faces terrible, stressful times. But what we have to realize is that it's all on how we deal with these stress issues. Uh, it's all how we deal with it. We can't let the stress beat us. And the stress beats so many people because the hospitals are filled with people with stress-related uh, illnesses. And I think it's two-thirds the amount of people in the hospitals now, a lot of it can be uh, traced back to stress on why they're there. And it's really just on how you're dealing with the stress and not letting it get the better of you. One of the best is, you know, listening to music, breathing techniques, and things like you mentioned. But another one is going back to the exercise. If you can get a good workout somehow, it releases the oxycodone. I'm sorry, the uh, this, um, I'm having a mind block right now on it. The serotonin, the serotonin. endorphins, yes. and then it's like no, it's serotonin and the endorphins in your body. And it releases those, and um, and it just gives you a calming sensation. And and what I think, you know, I've got these exercise bands, and I travel with them. And I think if I was driving across country back and forth, and I was in, in a, a truck a, quite a bit of time, I don't think I'd go anywhere without those exercise bands, because I'd pull off somewhere, Don, I'd connect the band is- to... The door handle, let, yeah. Let, let me jump in there. Um, we we try to go out and find those kinds of solutions for our listeners. It's really what we do. So when I was doing this, I came to the same conclusion. Um, I, my my One of my first businesses, I actually opened a gym when I was 19. I used to coach a lot of wrestling, high school wrestling. So I've been into fitness and working out. And, and I was trying to find a solution for drivers in the truck. And we came across a band system. I don't know if you've seen it or not. The X3, it's a bar and band and and just incredible. The whole workout itself, but I I couldn't agree more. And we sell it in our store. We make it nice and easy for them to get this stuff. But it's just an incredible tool to have with you in the truck. And and I'm familiar with that, the the bands with the bar. I'm familiar with those. And and I know they work. I mean, I, I stopped all my workouts except for the workouts with the bands. And focusing on the band workouts, you know, it's got all these websites and everything, do this 20 minutes a day. I, I, I noticed, like, immediate improvements in, in my uh, fitness level. So, yeah, I, I just think you got to find a common place. you got a lot of people go to music or meditation and breathing techniques. And you've got to find what works for you. Go to a space. The imagination works really well when you're doing visualization. Like, for instance, people who love the mountains or the beach to think about what it's like being in the mountains right now, being at the beach and hearing the waves and trying to take yourself from the moment and, and, and thinking about a place that brings you peace are all things we try to do with the marshals. And um, some worked and some didn't, but the ones where it didn't work, we said, don't give up on trying because there are answers. People do live with stress and they, they find ways to deal with it. And, and, and there are, there are ways. It's just finding the way that works for you is the, uh, the issue but there is a way and not to forget that there is a way yeah absolutely you know you, you mentioned visualization i want to go back to that i talked about i coached high school wrestling and i, I was big on technique uh, that was kind of my strength was just really rock solid technique uh, and we would practice it over and over and over repetition and i i would you know come up with a move or a defense and we would teach it all week or maybe two weeks leading up to an event and I was lucky if if one person would have actually won a match based on what we spent all that time on. You know, you have to do it, but two good wrestlers, you know, technique, it, it almost cancels each other out, but, but you have to have that. But the one thing I taught, and I, I wish I would have figured this out sooner, um, I had been learning about visualization and practicing it myself, and I thought, why can't I teach these to you know, high school wrestlers. And it was kind of an impromptu last minute almost. Uh, It was the day of the match. We had a morning practice that day. um, And I introduced it to them then. And then after school was out and we had several hours before the the match itself, we started working on it again. Now, here's something I, I barely scratched the surface of. All these other things we've practiced over and over and over. This I've just barely scratched the surface of. 
I really believe at the end of that match, there were three or four kids who would not have won their match had we not worked on that visual, visualization. It actually helped them that fast that I could see it. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know what could work better than visualization when you're really looking out at the outcome of the goal you're trying to achieve and picking yourself there. And, 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 and like, for instance, I used this situation when I was going through buds. I, I visualized, and I did that for four years. I did visualization for four years, picturing how cold those swims are going to be or how hard it's going to be to do all those push-ups and pull-ups and running in the sand. And I visualized it. So almost when I went up to do those tech, you know, those things they had us doing, it was like I was there before. And then, in my case, it was easier than I thought it would be. And, and, and it worked so well. And, I, of course, I didn't make up the program at all. It's, uh, great athletes use it all the time. And they, they know what's going to happen in the fight or in the match or in the competition they're going to be. And they know where they want it, the outcome to be. And they just visualize the outcome and they visualize how much, you know, maybe agony or pain or discomfort or, or work it's going to be involved to get there. But they're ready for it because they visualized it. And if they visualize hard enough, it's going to be easier than really what the, yeah. <laughs> what the reality might be for them. That's a great point. You know, one of the pushbacks I, I would get on this is, is when I would explain, you know, I would tell them, I want you to visualize you know, a wrestling match is six minutes. And it's with two good wrestlers, it's going to go the whole six minutes. Two good wrestlers, you very seldom see anybody get pinned. So it's going six minutes at this level. And I would have them visualize the entire six minutes. I, I want you to, and we would even set a timer. I would say, we're going to start the clock. And I want you to visualize the first two minute round. And then we'd stop and take a break. And I'd say, all right, now we're going to visualize the second two minutes. And some of them started saying, well, this isn't going to work because I know what I'm going to do, but I don't know what the other guy's going to do. And I said, that's the point of this. So let's think about this. You're, tell me what you're going to do. And he'd say, well, I, I'm going to shoot a low single leg. It's my favorite takedown. Great. What are the likely things the other wrestler is going to do when you shoot a low single? There's only so many counters. You know what they are. Visualize them using one of those counters. And then what are you going to do? And, and you can visualize what they're going to do. And you may not get it right every time, but the more of those scenarios you visualize, the more possibilities. I'm going to do this. What could they possibly do? Just, just asking that alone makes you so much better prepared for what you're going into. It sure does. It's, it's kind of like contingency planning. You know, you're thinking, what are all the what ifs? You, you get some of them. You won't get them all, but just having your mind trained that, okay, if, if this doesn't work out or if this doesn't go as planned, what could happen? And you start putting a list of contingencies together. And that list is much, much longer than your, your plan is. It's all the things that might go wrong. In the, in the military, we use contingency planning as a major, major, major step in our training for any mission or operation. Yeah, this is how we want it to go. But what if the helicopter crashes? What 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 if um, somebody gets hurt? What if someone gets shot coming in the door? And there's a contingency plan for everything. It's never how the plan goes. And the what ifs, the what ifs are is the long, long part of the plan that has to come together in your training and preparation, or at least in your mind. Yeah, and visualizing what I, could happen. I, I love that. You know, we we talked about stress and really managing stress is really just being able to shift your your nervous system out of the fight or flight mode and back to the rest and digest mode that's really what stress management is all about when you build your stress muscle it makes it easier to be able to do that because you have the strength to do it i i have to believe that is a huge part of what occurs during all of the the buds training is is, is you're giving people the ability to, to shift out of that fight or flight, which is a horrible place to be. Uh, we don't think well, we, we just respond and react back into the rest and digest where our brain starts working again and we can think. Um, you know, I asked you about your most memorable mission and, and, you know, hearing it sounds like it was a pretty scary time. Was there a time that you can remember where the fear took over for a time? And you, and you really had to fight to, to get out of that mode? 
I don't think so. I don't think, you know, there was a time where I was overcome with fear. I think mainly because of my mindset. Like, I know I'm going to get out of this. I was just so confident that we were going to win. And I'm so confident, you know, this the chute's going to open at 30,000 feet. And I'm so confident, stuck under a ship without oxygen, that it's going to make it. I just, I just always had in my mind that I'm going to prevail. I, I have. Um, so I, I was never overcome by fear. That that's incredible, really. When I think about what you've been through, and to be able to maintain that state is pretty incredible. I have to believe that that comes from the skills you've developed. That's what gives you the confidence, right? You know you've got the mindset, and, and but those skills are important too, right? You, you, we can get through a lot of stuff with our yeah. mind alone, but but that confidence has to come from knowing you can do this stuff. You know, the last the last time, which was just probably two months ago, I I I, I was at a gas station where most attacks happen now in the U.S. As you probably know, I'm sure you know. <laughs> But um, uh, I was pumping gas, and uh, this big, tall guy came up to me, and his pants were kind of around his hips, and his hat was crooked, and he looked stoned out of his mind. And he came up to me while I was pumping gas in my vehicle. He goes, hey, man, you got some money? And then I knew, you know, you go, you shift in colors. <laughs> Cooper's color code. Uh, so white is being totally unaware of your surroundings yellow is there could be a possible threat in the area then you shift to orange orange yet yeah, there is a threat red is when you shift by the flight i've got to do something but if you're in the black it means you're totally stuck because the threat came in front of your face so i'm always and you know i'm always aware of my surroundings so i'm always in the yellow zone this man walked up to me, and then I went. I shifted to orange. Yep, this possible threat, possible threat. And I always have a weapon with me, and um, and that's in my center console in my vehicle. And I sized him up immediately to see if he could have had a weapon with his shorts down like they were. Yeah, right. And I was thinking, yeah, he possibly could. And then um, he took a step closer to me, and then it kicked in. I I felt myself. I hate to say it this way, but comfortable and at peace knowing he makes the wrong move, he loses. Big yeah, time. right. And I was just so comfortable in knowing that. Um, and it's not because I've been on the range training or I can quick, you know, quickly jump in my vehicle, pull out my weapon and, and end the fight. But all of that mindset training made it that I'm going to beat this thing. It's not going to, if it comes between me and him, he's probably maybe 80 pounds heavier than me, much younger and a lot taller. But I'm positive, absolutely positive, without a doubt, even if he has a weapon, he's going to lose and I'm going to win. But And that was the last time something like that has happened where I had to, um, it just kicked in. It was in the subconscious. It was in the subconscious mind that you're going to win. Be calm, be relaxed, shift colors, don't ever be in the white. Go to the yellow, shift when it's appropriate time to shift to orange, there's a possible threat. Now, now you're in the red. Fight a flight. I'm ready to fight this one out. Um, I wasn't going to jump in my vehicle and hide off, you know, if he's going to point a gun at me, because you don't have time to do that. It takes a split second to pull the trigger. And all these things had already gone through my mind, and I was very comfortable. And, um, and, and, and I know I'll think like that for the rest of my life. And I've thought like that for the vast majority of my life. And it's, it's helped me in countless ways. I can count all the times that's helped this having that mindset. Yeah. You know what I want people to realize that you've been all over the world. You've been in incredibly dangerous situations. I mean, we, you could tell stories all day long. Go read the book. There's great, great stories in there, by the way. Um, and yet what we just heard from you was a situation that every one of us could be in today. Yeah. Now, yep. I want people to realize you sure that. could, actually, in our families, our yes. families as well. Right? Yeah. When you're out working, so, it, yep. You know what I think the absolute number one problem for most people is today, based on what you just described? It's their damn cell phone, their devices. Yeah. Uh, nobody has any situational awareness whatsoever when they're staring at that phone like everybody oh. does all day long. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're what Jeff Cooper, Colonel Cooper would call, they're in the white 
totally unaware of their surroundings. All their focus is on that little handheld device, and the rest of the world is not even in their focus in any way. But yeah. when the threat does come, when the big wolf does come around the corner, then they go right to the black, totally unaware and shocked and have no plan on what to do. And that is the killer. Uh, when you're in the white or the black, um, when the threat comes around, we call it the wolf. When the wolf comes, that could be the terrorist, the robber at a gas station, the burglar, the criminal. But when the, when the, uh, when the threat comes around the corner and you have zero plan, you usually go into the black. And, and uh, that's a, 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 deadly place, a deadly place to be. It really is. Um, one final question. I promise I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for your time today. It's, just, <laughs> just, it's a pleasure talking to you, Kevin. I've I enjoyed this. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I'm almost afraid to ask this question, um, but I can't imagine anybody that would have a better perspective on this. Um, I, I was in the military for the Army as a helicopter crew chief in um, the mid-'80s. Um, I am a little shocked on what I see, but I, I don't always like to believe what I see in the news and the media and all that. What's your take on our military readiness today? Well, thank you for your service, for one. Um, I'm very disappointed what's happening to our military. You know, and I, I don't want to sound political, but you, you Ronald can Reagan if you want. gave us a <laughs> big boost. Okay. Uh, Ronald Reagan gave us a big boost. Uh, President Bush gave us a big boost. President Trump gave us a big boost. Obama really hurt our military, and Biden's hurt it more than anybody that I've ever in my lifetime. And now we have Secretary of Defense, Chief of Staff, telling units like SEAL Team and Rangers and Delta Force and all the military units, okay, you're going to have to have a stand down so you guys and ladies can learn to talk proper pronouns. You can talk to transgender people, and you can talk to people that are different than yourselves. And for us, us, our communities to have to stop training to deal with that. I, yeah, there's a place for conversation for that, but it's not a, at a military level. And, and and also when you pull out of Kabul and you leave all our troops behind, and now now we have the, the, the great interpreters and translator who helped us. Now they're getting our visits, door-to-door visits, and having their tongues cut out because we left them all back there. We've never been like that before. And General Miley, Secretary of Defense, Chief of Staff, will say, well, the reason our, our recruiting is so low is because of COVID and there are some other reasons. The reason our recruitment level is so low is, uh, low is because we have an administration that doesn't back the military anymore. And if I had a son or a daughter and this administration was in place, I'd say hold off on the military right now because they, the, the administration does not have our the backs of the military like it, previous administrations had. You know, it's interesting. Um, you mentioned Obama and, you know, I was I, I was in the military when Reagan was president. Uh, so I, I remember that time well. And I also remember things were changing. When I got into the military in like 82, their physical requirements had really gone to hell. I, I was shocked at how many E6s were way overweight and uh, when I first got in, and, and they actually started changing it while I was in and got stricter again, it, it felt like a better place to be in the military when I got out than when I got in. There was actually a change during that time. But during Obama's presidency, my son came to me and talked about going into the military, and I actually talked him out of it. And I felt horrible. I was really conflicted on, on whether I should talk him out of it or not, but I, I just looked at what was going on back then, and I thought it was awful. I, today, I, I, that's why I was afraid to even ask the question. I can't imagine what it is like for the elite teams and the SEAL teams to have to deal with this right now. You know, and, and I've been out for a while, but I, I talked to a lot of young guys who are still on active duty or just got out, and they're so disappointed on this woke mindset that's come down and infiltrated into our military. And it's not like it used to be. And I really, really haven't given up hope. And I do hope it changes. So the military goes back to some semblance of what it used to be like. Because this woke nonsense, this woke mentality, this, um, you know, easy come, easy go, do what you want. Um, if you don't feel like doing PT, you don't have to. If you don't feel like being on time, it's not a big deal. If you're, if you're overweight and don't want to take care of yourself, uh, 
don't, it's okay. You know, I know nobody will make fun of me because I will be offended. That whole mentality, there's not a place for it in the military. I mean, China and Russia are laughing at us. They, yes, they are. I mean, they, they, they don't put up with that nonsense. Uh, Putin said, yeah, we had that woke stuff try to come across our border and we shut that down quickly. And of course, we know China doesn't put up with it easy. But if we end up, you know, there's always a war. There's always, we've always, always. Been a war. But if the next war comes across with us and China, um, you know, that, what mindset's going to win? This mentality we have now coming from the Biden administration or the mindset of a hardcore ruler with, um, who doesn't put up with that nonsense? Hey. I'm worried about, you know, the greatest generation, the greatest generation, my father's generation. When, when, he, when we were attacked, Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he quit high school, went right to the military, like I mentioned earlier. What happens now if we get attacked and we really need all hands effort? I mean, right. the all hands we have now are have pink female, fingernail polish yeah. on, dressing up like girls, getting transformation right. operations, and and I, I I'm, I'm I can't even picture a future if if something I, else when something else happens. I, I agree. That's kind of why I was afraid to ask. I I think I knew the answer, but I I really respect your insight into this. I I, I believe that we as a country uh, are suffering from a severe shortage of testosterone. Uh, I have some theories on on why, but you know, one of the clues that I had something must have changed in the military. I had a pretty big event happen. Uh, a little over a year ago, I had been on Sirius XM for 15 years. I had actually been moved into what was considered the primetime slot on our channel. Um, and I made one comment on the air and got canceled. And I, I was shocked at, at the person. So remember when the, the Canadian truckers protest and strike was going on and it was oh, sure. worldwide news. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. I normally don't support these kinds of things. They're usually not very well thought out. There usually isn't a good leader. This one, though, I really think they, they did it well. They did it better than I had ever seen. There was a really good reason for doing this one. They were not allowed to cross the border without that shot. And that was just awful for the industry. So while that is going on, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about it. I'm talking to a driver who is down in the middle of it, and they had towed his truck and he didn't know where it was. They had attached his bank account so he couldn't get to his money. We're talking about that on the air. I'm talking to this guy and I'm furious over this. It's not even our country, but I'm furious over yeah. this. And at the time, yeah. There was an American group of drivers that was in California and they were making a big deal about they were heading to D.C. and they were showing support for the Canadian drivers. And yeah, I remember that. So yep. while I'm talking about that, I actually see something come across my news feed, an Arizona congressman who is an ex-Marine. That's what really got me about this. He was an ex-Marine. He made the statement. He was an ex-Marine officer. He made the statement, let those truckers come to D.C. We will confiscate their trucks and give it to a company that wants to work. And I, I was so furious <laughs> over that statement from a, an ex-military personnel. That's not how this country works. You will absolutely not confiscate somebody's private or business um, assets just because you don't like mm -hmm. that they're coming there to, to say something you don't like. And I said on the air, I said, he should be shot for treason. He heard it, contacted Sirius XM, was canceled before the day was over. Uh, well, I mean, that used to be what people would get when they committed treason. Exactly. And, that was um, kind of my know, point. I don't so, think it was that outrageous of a statement. Yeah. Did, and look what the left's able to say now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, yeah. they, they did me a favor. We, uh, after being on Sirius XM for 15 years, we took one day off. We came back the, the day after that live, and we've been doing our own show ever since. Yeah, good for you. I don't want to get you in trouble by saying other things, too, but <laughs> they're doing the best they can to suppress our voices. They know? are. They are. We have to fight back. You no, know, as you know. And it doesn't matter yeah, do. what do. price we have to pay. We have to fight back because it, it, the price will be far worse if we don't. Exactly. Exactly. That's so well said. Just that's exactly the truth right there.
All right, Don, so I got to yeah, tell I, you. I, I find am, myself. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I, I find I, I don't even like it when I, I'm afraid to say something because that what they did to us is they're trying to make our feelings and beliefs when, and the way we grew up and the way this country is brought up for us to say anything pertaining to that. So many of us now, including myself, I don't like it when I have to question, should I say this or not? I, because you're almost afraid of, you know, getting censored again. I've been censored too. And um, I, I don't like the way that it's making our country as a whole think. I agree. And so whenever it pops up on me and I start thinking, oh, should I ask this or not? I don't even like that I question myself on that anymore. So I, I agree. And we're actually... Um we did something about that. I actually, I'm using a lot of what you teach in your book. I said earlier, you know, you're able to remain confident in a certain situation because you've prepared yourself. We made the decision when when we decided to come back and do our own show that not only were we going yeah. to do our own show, we were going to build our entire infrastructure for ourselves. We would not lease phone lines from anybody. We won't lease a, a service or a website. With the idea of you can't cancel me anymore. You would have to turn off the Internet now to cancel me. So now I have the confidence to say whatever the hell I feel like saying. If it's that important, I'm just going to say good, it. Good. You beat you beat them. We're trying. We're certainly yeah, beat we're certainly going to put yeah. up a good fight. So I, I got to let you go. I know you've got to get on with your day. I do want to say I'm really looking forward to one more thing this year. Uh, and I know a lot of our listeners are as well. November 2nd to the 4th this year, you're going to be in Nashville, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yep. Um, I'm looking forward to that date. I, I am really looking forward to this conference. I know we've got a lot of listeners that will be there. Um, I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand and thank you for your service. And I can't wait to see your uh, your keynote. Well, well, thank you, Kevin. And um, I look forward to meeting you in person and and I certainly res respect and appreciate all you do with your show and, and, and all the good word you put out. So if somebody wants to learn more about you, there's so much to learn. What What's the single best place to go get started? Probably, uh, I've got a website that's um, usfrogman.com. It's F-R-O-G-M-A-N-N, -N, like my last name. Oh, I like that. Com. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that's probably the best way. Excellent. And, um, I have a clearance with the government, so I have a, uh, I'm not really on social media, but now I just got back on at a small, small level. Um, that's, that's, you know, I can, I can do while I have my clearance. Got it. So it's, so I'm not okay. really on social media, like that type of stuff. I, you know, I never thought about that issue. That's interesting. Uh, one other thing, I'll, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if we'll be able to pull this off. We're kind of planning, but I'll put you on the spot a little bit. If if we get a chance uh, at the conference, maybe we could sit down and do another show or an interview. Oh, of course, Kevin. Yeah, of course. I'd love that. Fantastic. Yeah, I hope we can at the conference because I'd like to come out of I was thinking there's some good mountains out that way. I might come out early and do some hiking out that way, too. There you go. There you go. I have a, I have a feeling your hiking is a little different than what most of us think about hiking, but uh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Donna, well, I look I, forward I, to meeting you, Kevin, and yeah, I appreciate you having me on the I, show today. I could go on all day. Thanks so much for joining us and uh, looking forward to meeting you. Thank you, Kevin. All right. have, a, have a good day. Take care. All right, we, uh, we're going to get to the phone calls. Uh, let's see, what do I got going on? Uh, it's a little past 9.30. Uh, my interview to, is my interview today 2 o'clock my time? Does anybody know? I should probably know that. Well, we're good for right now. I'll get some calls. It's a free-for-all if you want to jump in and join us. 855-950-3835. You know, I ask for questions from the audience. I got a couple. I know I saw one and I didn't get to it. Um, I think we're going to come up with a, a system. I, I would like users to be able to submit questions. What happens, though? I get in the zone and then I never know where to go to find it. We're, we're That's our fault. I'll... Um, my fault, really. I'll formalize a way so that I have an easy way. I was searching around trying to find the questions and then I lost my train of thought. So I've said before, I don't multitask well. Let's, uh, let's go to the phones. 
Let's go to Pennsylvania. Brian, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. Uh, well, when I'm king of the world, I'm going to make it illegal to talk about rate per mile unless you qualify it with a length of haul and a time on the truck. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that. Uh, with loads especially, but even with your overall numbers, I'm surprised you didn't accuse me of working part-time the other day because I only did uh, like 40,000 miles uh, in six months this year, which is a little low for me, but not not crazy low. I normally do 90,000 a year, but I, uh, I'm i not part-time, uh, you know, when you have short <laughs> hauls, but that just happens. Yeah, yeah, you end up with a like, lot more on duty, not driving kind of time in operations like that. Right, right. Yeah, we talk about how you know most freight is scheduled, and you know there's there's only so much you can do on uh, shorter hauls. But I say all that to say that uh, I guess I'll stir everyone up and let them know I'm out hauling cheap freight today because I'm, I'm getting tired of sitting at home. And even if your truck and trailer are paid for, uh, especially if you have your own authority and, uh, you know, if you have a family, that makes a difference. Um, you know, we're still talking $900 a month insurance. Uh, you need some profit for yourself for at home. And uh, we have a modest mortgage and because I'm an idiot, we have two car payments and just added a third one. Um, but that, uh, there was a reason for that, but it, I, I know it's stupid, but I, uh, entrepreneur's curse. I'm just going to work harder. So, so I'm out here today going to North Carolina for the first time in years for uh, two bucks a mile, just about 1100 on about 500 miles. And I got, assuming I make this appointment, um, 1350 coming back straight back to the house um on about the same miles so that's uh i i I get to experience how the load board half lives the the beginning of this week anyway uh already got to deal with nestle with a a five-hour load time and uh i'm going to food lion so everybody pray for me Uh, (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna need it yeah there you go but uh but anyway no wondered why you never use this analogy, but I think I know why um, about fuel tax. Um, I compare it to income tax, which (laughs) I know is dangerous because nobody understands that either. You are correct, though. And I tried to use (laughs) that analogy. You are absolutely correct. It didn't work. Here's part of the problem. You hit the problem right on the head. Analogies are powerful if we can compare something we don't understand to something we do understand. That's how analogies should work. This is a great analogy, except the problem is not enough people understand the income tax system. Right, yeah. Now I think owner operators, you know, a lot of them do understand income tax I, so i'm not sure that they do you know if i if i may well maybe not but um if i, if well, I may me, i'll just let me tell quick. you i can prove that some don't i used to have people ask me they've been an owner operator the whole year and they haven't made any quarterly payments and they're asking me whether or not there's any chance they're going to get a refund that that clearly tells me <laughs> they have no clue how the tax system works right right yeah so i don't know i i again if you understand income tax every time you get a paycheck that's like buying fuel right every time you get a paycheck you pay tax every time you buy fuel you pay tax and And, then when we do the return and they're both let's just they're both estimates You, you you're we don't know how much tax you owe yet we're already making payments towards that number, but we don't know what that number is in income tax and fuel tax. So the, the systems are almost identical. Yep, yep. And then when you do your returns, that, that's when you figure out what you really owe and compare it to what you paid and either owe more or you get some back. Right. 
But the, the single biggest mistake people make when I hear them talk, they talk as though where they buy their fuel has something to do with their tax. And it doesn't. It has zero to do with your tax. The tax itself right. is has right. nothing to do with where you buy fuel. The tax is determined by where you drove. That's what they don't understand. I've heard people say, right. oh, no, I get fuel tax. I understand it. So I never buy fuel in Oregon or Pennsylvania or whatever state they choose. The minute you say you never buy fuel somewhere tells me you don't understand what you're talking about. Because if, if you understand the system, right. you would know there will be a time where you should buy fuel in every state. There's always a time where it actually does make sense to buy fuel in California. Yep. But you have to know when. And if you make the statement, I never buy fuel. Well, that just tells me you really don't understand the system at all. Yeah. Yeah, so that's all I got. If uh, if you can afford to sit out the cheap freight, well, by all means, I, I do my share of it too. But you're going to lose less money hauling cheap freight than you will sitting at home. Yep, that's a good way to put it. You'll lose less. We're not we're not saying that this should be your business model to run around pulling cheap freight. We're just saying that it is a tool for your business so that you remain more profitable by using that tool than if you didn't. Yep. But you know, the problem is they take it personally. They think that somebody that offered them that load at that price is just out to screw them and they take it personally. It's not personal. They're just doing what we do. They're just trying to make as much profit as they can in their business. All you have to do is understand that and work with it. That's right. All right, Brian, good stuff. Uh, that's all I got. All right, that's all we need. We'll talk to you again soon. Let's... Uh, Let's go to Texas this time. Dwight, welcome to the program. Uh, hey, Kevin. Uh, great interview. Really enjoyed, Don. Uh, it really hit home because today my baby girl, after six years, got out of the Navy. And, uh, oh, it's been a horrible, horrible idea, uh, uh, deal, ordeal. Well, at, at the and, very least, uh, tell, her, tell her we all said thanks for her service. Well, she went in just barely, a little over 19, and everybody, we were so proud. Her grandpa was in the Navy, and he was so proud, and it just went downhill. And and she graduated number one in her class. So you're thinking, okay, she, she's got a good long career here, and uh, we were so proud. But it just went downhill. She... The woke, and she's super conservative, like the rest of us, the good Americans. Anyway, so between the woke, between the foreigners that they let in for a few years' service, she had some commanders that couldn't barely speak English, barely speak English. And then uh, if you were woke and uh, was going to be a transgender, they got promoted and just on and on and on. And I, they just. You know, I, I, I want to say I can't imagine this, but actually I can. I can imagine because even the military that I was in in the mid 80s had some problems like this, not so much the woke stuff. Uh, but the reason I did not stay in, the single biggest reason, I really wanted to fly helicopters, the single biggest reason I did not stay in, because even then, promotions many, many times were not based on skill and qualifications and results. They just weren't. They were very, very political. Yeah. Um, the one that got me, um, I went through our, our advanced training with somebody, helicopter training, and the guy should have been washed out during training. He was a horrible mechanic. He didn't understand. He didn't want to understand. I don't know why he chose that MOS. And when he got out of the training, he was not qualified to work on a helicopter. And then he, he at least had enough brains to know he wasn't qualified and he was terrified to work on one. He was terrified he was going to do something that was going to cause the helicopter to crash and somebody was going to die. And he didn't even make it a month on the flight line. And because of that, they moved him 
back to the office. So now he's basically just the first sergeant's gopher and the captain's right there in that office all day long. And guess who got the first promotion in our unit to E4? Not any of the people who were doing what they were trained to do, turning wrenches on the helicopters and keeping them flying. The guy who got coffee for the first sergeant got the first promotion. And that was when I said, I don't think I can do this. Right, right. Well, and I tell you, uh, she was, she did spend a few years uh, on a ship. Uh, and of course we would follow them on, um, their website and they would, uh, congratulate their promotions and, oh my gosh, you know, most of them, you couldn't even pronounce their name. A lot of, I, I mean, from countries like, well, a lot of from China, you know, you're like, you're, you're letting all these Chinese for a few years service become a, uh, working on these ships. And, and then they're the ones that got promoted. He's the one that couldn't speak English. And ah, it was just horrible. But I, I tell you, once Biden come along, we just like, could we just, I, I, I'm thinking that we've got her out and hopefully long enough that they can't pull her back in if this idiot dictator gets us into a yeah, war or nuclear right. war or whatever. And. So was it, was I don't it, know what the time limit is. I think it's six years. Isn't that the total enlistment? Oh, my. No, no. I mean, I think her original six years covers her. Uh, okay. I okay. Think. Well, I, I didn't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's changed or not. Because I knew he just... My enlistment was six yeah. years, three active, three inactive reserves. And then I chose to come out of active and re-sign for the National Guard. So I was active reserve, basically, active guard. But the, it was six years. And I kind of decided if they could call me back in that three-year period, I might as well make some money uh, during that time and stay right. trained. A and stay trained. I didn't want to be out for, you know, two and a half years and then have to go back with no training. That sounded right. awful. So. Yeah, I, it, it's possible it changed, but I, it, the way I remember it is I think every branch was a six-year commitment no matter how long you were active for. The Army had some programs where you could be active for just two of those six years. Right, yeah. She's Navy, things was yeah, a little different. Yeah. And, but I say, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. It's um, I just hope that... Um, because I know Biden signed some stuff that uh, saying he, he was going to be able to pull people back sooner. He already did. He pulled back 3,000 yeah, inactive reserves. Yeah, that that worries me. And again, yeah. I, you yeah. know, I, I, I talked my son out of going to the military. I felt horrible for doing it. But I, 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 I would have loved to have seen him serve our country, but I don't want to see him serve our country in a military that I would not want to be a part of. I don't want to go to war with those people. Hell no. They need to right. fix the military uh, first. And like Don said, the mindset, and of course, some of it is just our time. You know, I'm, I'm 65, so, and and I was raised super, super conservative by, uh, by an Army father, and uh, so super conservative, and his family come from, from uh, Czech Republic, you know, Czechoslovakia, and so... Uh, they ran away from communists and, and Hitler and all that. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I so have, anyway, I, I would have loved to have had some time to talk to Don about Ukraine right now. I think that would be an awesome topic to get oh, his take on. Yeah. And and, you know, what really happened in Afghanistan and, and some of those things he actually can't talk about. I mean, he really can't. That's why he said he's really not right. on social media because he's so limited uh, but it would still be interesting to get his take on Ukraine. I, I, although I, I'm, I'm about 99.9% .9 sure I know what he would say. The same thing. Yeah. The same thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, kind of crazy. Well, well, anyway, well, I appreciate it. And um, great interview. Great interview. I, I, if if I, I'm on a dedicated run, and I I'm certainly hope I don't, don't lose it, but um, if if I get a chance, I'd love to come to Nashville and uh, uh, see y'all and and just come to the program. So, 
You know, you I, never know. I, I never have know. been doing trucking events for a very, very, very long time. Truck shows, you know, conferences, speaking engagements. And, and for a while there, I was getting kind of burnt out on them. I quit for a couple of years. Uh, and I, I've been back. I've been doing a little bit of speaking so I don't get too rusty. I am really looking forward to this. I'm really looking forward to the challenge of doing a keynote uh, with a group I really want to talk to. Uh, so I've been already busy working on that. I don't do a lot of keynote stuff. Keynotes are challenging for me. I would rather, you know, do more educational kind of seminar stuff. But I love keynotes. I there, It's just really hard to be good at a keynote. You got to put a lot of practice in. But I am looking forward to this event more than I've looked forward to a trucking event probably since the CMC. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I agree. And I'm a NASDAQ member. And um, so uh, the company I'm with now has got a awesome fuel card, but uh, I still keep the NASDAQ up because uh, you never know. And uh, so, well, if, but if, yeah, you might ask them if, will it be later some of that uh, put out on podcast? Do you know or I y'all's keynote, we, your keynote? We could find out. I'll find out for sure. I haven't seen that anywhere. Lisa or Brittany might know. Um, I'll find out if any of it. Um, honestly, I would love to see a bunch of our tribe there. I really hope we take over the place. Yeah. Well, if I'm because I, you know, I might. I just have to look at the dates. Uh, well, the problem is my run starts on Sunday, so it's that's oh, pretty challenging right there. Well, if I remember right, it's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Is that right? I know it's three days. Okay. Let me okay. let me go look. Uh, October second, third, and fourth. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Hey you uh, And you don't have to go to all yeah, three days. I might be available. Yeah, I might have to try to, might be able to work it out. If I'd have to fly up and fly back. So, well, anyway, well, I'll check that out and check and see if it's going to be um, recorded. And uh, anyway, appreciate your time and uh, we'll keep listening. Excellent. All right. Thanks for the call. Take care. Let's go to oh, phone lines. We've got some open lines. I'll go till I run out of calls today. So you want to jump in 855 855- Nine five zero three eight three five. We're heading off to Nebraska this time. Paul, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. Uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks for all your help. I'm really trying to take this numbers thing serious. I've called with you and gone over them one time before, probably for the first side of it. I sat down this weekend and did your mint program, but first i just want to go over my numbers with you for the this year to date sure all right so i've got uh, two reports here let me see what i'm looking at i've got uh january to july of 2023 oh okay one's a p and l one's the business report got it okay um i'm gonna look at the business report first so we'll start at the top uh the top line on my report is what most people would refer to as the bottom line we, we broke a lot of accounting rules right. when we built this program. If the bottom line is so important in business, and it is, and it's where the phrase even comes from, what's the bottom line? It, that comes from a profit and loss statement. The bottom line shows us our profit. Well, if it's so important, why don't we put it at the top then? It's kind of what I thought. So I put it up at the top. It's the first thing I want to see. So without knowing anything else about your business, I know that you are profiting just over a dollar a mile dollar two. That's incredible. That is, that is a number that 10 years ago, we almost never talked about because nobody was achieving that number as an owner operator. Very, very few. I had a couple real specialty operations that did it. Um, but as far as general freight, uh, flatbed, van reefer, that kind of stuff, it, nobody was breaking a dollar a mile. So we never talked about it. Um, now, it's a really good indication that you're doing well. So right away, looking at one line on this report, I know you're doing pretty well. Uh, let's jump in and see what some of the other numbers are. So your gross per mile before we take any um, expenses off, $2.37 a mile. Congratulations. That's a really good number in today's environment. And, and 
this, if you can achieve this kind of number, and a lot of our listeners are still doing this, this is nowhere near what I would consider a freight recession. Not when you can do numbers like this. And and we seem to see a lot of people doing numbers like this. Uh, 237 a mile, all miles. I have these numbers. Oh, go ahead. I have these numbers being leased to a carrier pulling other people's trailers. Excellent. I, really, that is incredible. So we could dig a little deeper into, you know, I always go to fuel next. Uh, honestly, your, your fuel cost per mile is not that impressive. Right. So you're doing something else really well. I need to, but, I'm and, working on. And there's some room in there. That's the first thing that tells us. You're at 67 cents a mile for fuel. That it, It's possible to get that down into the 40s today. Um, I just need to slow it down. There you go. Maintenance, 27 cents a mile. Little high, but that's not not out of the norm, not unusual. We wouldn't look too hard at that. Even though your two bigger costs aren't really as good as we would like to see them, one of the advantages of being leased to a carrier, you don't have a lot of other big costs. Your insurance, for the most part, actually a little higher than most people are paying. You're at 15 cents a mile for that. But that's not horrible. I mean, uh, your equipment payments, do you have any? Uh, it's under truck loan. I'm at 24 cents a mile on it. Oh, okay, you did yours a little different. 24 cents a mile. So the the exciting news here, you've got a really good net and you also have some room for improvement. You can make it even better. Yeah, and I called you before on the maintenance. The maintenance is up there because it's a, a new, new to me Volvo and I got new tires. Yep. All around, that, I got the air dog, everything, it's going down. <laughs> so then what happens is you'll see the pattern each quarter as you look at your business report, that maintenance cost will look better and better because the more miles now even that out. Okay. But uh, just now I'm going to swap over to the personal side and talk to Mint with you. I feel like I'm doing a good side on the numbers on here but I've slacked very hard on the personal side and I sat down this weekend and did mint.com and figured out my net worth and I knew it was negative. I just so, want to, I guess one question on there is before, I added the- Before we get my, to the questions, let me say congratulations for two big reasons. One, just for doing it. That very few people ever take this step and that's why they never get their personal finances under control. That's why 90% of the people in this country who work 40 or 50 years retire and they're still dependent on somebody else for money, either the government, Social Security, they have to work a part-time job, whatever. It's sad. If they want to go work a part-time job and not require retire, I'm all for that. But most people are not taking a part-time job they really enjoy because they can they're taking a part-time job they hate because they have to. And that's sad. And, and much of it is because they don't do what you just did. They don't take that first step to just face it. You did that, but you also did something else I'm going to congratulate you for. You knew that you hadn't been doing the right things around this. You knew it was going to be bad news and you did it anyway. Most people, if you can convince them that they should do this, they'll start to think about how bad it's going to look and then they'll change their mind and they won't do it. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I just, I'm looking at the personal side because I had things happen. We moved my mother in with me and I just, I wanna be better off, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. So how bad uh, was it? My, uh, my net worth at age 33 is negative 53,000. Okay. And all uh, I'm excited because you know the number, because that changes everything. Again, most people would guess and go, yeah, well, I know it's going to be negative. I know I've made some mistakes. I'll go fix some things and then I'll do it. They never fix anything and they don't even know what to fix. I mean, if you haven't identified what the problem really is in depth and detailed, how are you going to know what to fix? So I know that number sounds scary. I, I, I'm excited for you. I, I'm glad you know it. That's that's how you fix it. And I feel like I already, I guess the, my next step is without asking you what to look the problems are. I know it's some credit card debt, but that I'm already on track to get that taken care of. But 
the big chunk of it is a, a 2020 pickup I bought new three years ago. Get rid of it. That's pretty much, if I get rid of it, that's pretty much all of it right there. Get rid of it. And uh, I guess the, what, I don't know how to go about starting to build my net worth after I get rid of that. What I, I, I don't know. I yes, guess. you do. Yes, you do. Don't go buy a vehicle like that again. That's one way not to, to start fixing it. One of the ways to really start fixing it is stop doing the things that broke it. You don't need to learn anything new, not yet. The first approach is to just, let's just stop doing the things that broke it in the first place. That's why we identify it. You said there's some credit card debt in there. Well, stop that. There's a car in there you shouldn't have bought. Okay, already, go buy a car like that again, but let's take the really big step and go get rid of this one no matter how much it hurts. And uh, it's not going to hurt to get rid of it. I've already looked into it and Good. I'm getting ready to move Good. forward with it. Look, here's what I'll tell you. Right now in your mind, you, you even said it. I really don't know what to do. You're going to know what to do. I promise. that This isn't that hard. You've already done the hardest part. You will figure out what to do each step. As you get to it, you've already started working on getting rid of the truck. You'll figure this stuff out because you've done the hard work. And if you ever don't know exactly what to do, call me. I can help with that. uh, uh, That's all I'm going to leave this call with. I just want to thank you for everything you do. And and all the people that call in and talk about their experiences, they help out. That's just what we all need. Thank you, Kevin, and you have a good day. Excellent. Congratulations. Let's uh, let's go to Missouri. Leroy, welcome to the program. Hey, how you doing, Kevin? Good. What's on your mind today? Uh, I got. Uh, let me see. How do I ask this? It's kind of simple. Uh, I need to know on the Apple Pay. My wife has an Apple phone, Apple account. She already has the Apple Pay. But how do you? Is the Apple Pay the same as what you're putting the money into? Uh, let me try to make sure I say this exact, I'm going to go look it up because I want to make sure I give you the details right. Uh, yeah, I got lost looking there too. Yeah. So, um, it is part of the card. So the card itself, the Apple credit card, you've got that, the, this new high yield savings account, um, right now they're offering 4.15%. It'll probably change here and there. If rates go up, it'll go up. I trying to figure out, I'm trying to remember what I, I don't think I had to do much at all to set this up. Um, yeah. Yeah. My wife already has a, like, like I said, she don't, she don't have the physical card. She did. She declined it at the time. I did too. But she had the Apple pay. Yeah, I did too. I don't have a card for it. I just have it set up in my phone. And actually, it's not even set up on my phone right now where I could actually, I could go look at it. I just switched phones. And that's one of the things that does not transfer over. Even if you do a full transfer on your phone, the Apple Pay needs to be reset up from scratch. And I just haven't bothered to do it yet. That's why I can't remember but it, but it is it's just part of the account. I I think there are some steps to go set it up. But then once that's done, you can just start depositing money in there. Okay. And then the second part of that, it's kind of a two part question into the whole thing. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, she's got her four hundred one k, and we just paid off one oh, loan. We so we figure uh, if we're going to borrow. I we did, figure if we borrow money. I did find this. Hold on a second. Um, users okay, okay. can easily set up and manage their savings account directly from Apple Card in the Wallet app. So go to your phone and open the Wallet oh. app, and that in there are the steps to open the account. Okay, okay, I'll do that when I get back in. I'm uh, I'm out driving right now, so I'll get that when I get back on, back in. Okay, it's on because it's on her phone. I got I got an Android. She's got an Apple. I know. It, yeah, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Uh, the second part is is uh, I'm going to uh, uh, want the, like I said, we just paid off our 401k loan because we figured if we're going to borrow money, we might as well borrow from 401, so we're paying ourselves back, kind of. Yes, I agree. And, uh, okay, so we're going to borrow the max amount again, which is like six, seven uh, thousand right now. Okay. And uh, I know we just started late life, but uh, we're going to put that into the Apple Pay for now because uh, I'm trying to save up cash to, uh, buy some land where I own the land and it's only like 10,000 for three quarters of an acre. So okay. buy that. Good. And that way 
uh, that'll be the last step of me owning everything. I own all my cars. They're old cars. They're, you know, 2002 and older. Yep. But I own them. You know, I have title. I live in the fifth wheel with my wife. I have the title. The truck I pull it with, I have the title. So Excellent. land is the only thing I don't own. So That's a good first investment. I figure if I'm going to, yep. uh, like I said, then we're slowly but surely build up around the uh, camper. Once we own the land, so yeah, no. I, but I figure if I'm going to be saving the money, I might as well I might as well take it out of the loan, yes. and put it in Apple Pay and let you know Apple Pay pay while I'm doing it. Yeah, and, and any interest you're paying, you're paying back to yourself anyway. It's actually a forced yeah. way to increase your savings. So I, I'm all for this. I think it's a great yeah. plan. Uh, I think you've got a good solid plan overall. You just have to keep working it. That's it. I think you're on the right track. Oh, it's. It's been a long struggle because I, I, I'm that idiot for the longest time. I, if, it, if it was new new and great out there, I had to own it. Yeah. I didn't I, care, you know, about that. Uh, I, I know, yeah. know the feeling. It, I finally learned, you know, it's like, well, you know what? Uh, get small loans, you know, when you need them. Don't get too carried away. Something that you can't get out from under if you have to or whatever. That's just kind of the way I do it now. Good. Pay for everything and, yeah. All right, that's all. I just wanted to, that Apple Pay was kind of throwing me off. So, like I said, I don't mess around with that Apple account very well and, I didn't want to go in there jacking it up. And- yeah, it, I, it's it's pretty simple. Like I said, it I just it, it's in the wallet app itself. So go to the iPhone, your wife's iPhone, open the wallet app, poke around in there. There's not a lot in there, so it's actually pretty easy to find once you know that's where you should be looking. All right, uh, we are out of calls, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, and get prepared for my interview with Dr. Wolfson. It's backwards this time. Dr. Wolfson is interviewing me on his uh, video podcast. I have no idea when this episode is going to air, but I will find out today uh, and we will let you know. So we will see you back here tomorrow for the Power Hour. I think it's a fairly normal week this week. I don't really think we've got a lot going on. Uh, Do I have any guests this week? Uh, I'm not sure if I do or not. I don't think so. Uh, So a lot of time for questions this week. Uh, We'll look forward to that. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Be safe, be profitable, be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey.